So we have the heart of yoga is the topic that we'll discuss. The heart of yoga is the yoga of the heart. Yeah, can you move ahead? Yoga has become immensely popular in the world today. In fact, the United Nations celebrates the World Yoga Day. And about two million people, two billion people, according to UN News, practice yoga. And it says that they practice it because it works. Now, what do we mean by it works? It offers some health benefits. It helps us to find a way to be healthier in a more holistic way, without necessarily having to take in more chemicals into our body. Okay, go ahead. At the same time, yoga can work in much more ways than what we normally talk about. So, yoga is a multi-layered concept and it has much more potential than what we are currently tapping. And whether somebody can practice the physical postures or not, yoga can actually take us much deeper beyond. So for example, if somebody has a powerful device, if somebody's got been gifted a mobile, and they know that the mobile is good and they're using it very well. But sometimes the mobile itself is like a universe. And there's so many features in it, which you may not even know about. And then we hear hears about some new release phone and that has a particular feature. And then we discover that our phone, own phone had that feature. So yoga is like that, which has multiple le levels of understanding of what yoga is. Yeah. So we will talk about the heart of yoga. We'll talk about going to the essence of yoga. What it is essentially about. What, traditionally how it has been understood and how today that understanding can broaden the benefits that we may get from yoga. So traditionally, it is understood that yoga has eight limbs. These are Sanskrit words for it. Basically, yam niyam essentially means individual rules and collective rules. This is what we should do, this is what we should not do. Asan is what is primarily practiced nowadays, where we sit in particular postures. So the postures are important. But if you consider a game like, say, cr uh, like cricket or baseball, now in such games, in such games, whenever the batsman, the batter is about to bat, the batter stands in a particular pose. And the pose may be with the ba bat left high, the legs spread wide, with the legs close to each other. The point of the pose is that when the ball comes, the ball should be hit with the maximum force. So the pose, the posture is not the goal in itself. The posture is a tool for a particular goal. Similarly, in yoga, there are various postures. And the postures themselves can benefit us physically. But beyond that, the postures are meant for a purpose. The poses are meant that our own consciousness, as like a batter with a bat, hits the ball forcefully. Similarly, the poses are meant to help us raise our consciousness upwards to perceive higher realities, to understand ourselves better, to understand our life better, to see life from a higher perspective. And so that's why beyond asana, there are higher stages. There's a stage called pranayam. Pranayam strain centers on regulating our breath, by which our, our thoughts and our mind is very closely connected with the breath. When we are angry, our breath starts coming moving faster. When we calm down, our uh, breath is normally slower. So consciously also, if we slow down and regulate our breath, we can, uh, we can calm down our mind. And then beyond that is the next four stages, which are more internal. So this pratyahar. Pratyahar is actually turning away from externals, focusing inwards, trying to understand who we are. And in pratyahar, there's not so much inner vision. There is just shutting off of outer distraction. Like suppose we are studying a book. It's a little difficult to understand. But if at the while we are studying that book, our phone is also beeping some message, maybe a TV is on nearby, somebody is chit-chatting, then we won't be able to focus much. But if you just turn off the phone, turn off the TV, go to a room where we can focus on studies, then we have shut off the distractions and the possibility to focus on that book is greater. So similarly, with Pratyahar, we shut off 
external distractions. And the last three stages are actually inwards. There is dhyan, dharan, and samadhi. This is progressively we go inwards, and the inner absorption, the inner meditation starts becoming deeper and deeper. And at the level of samadhi, we perceive who we are in its fullness, in its clarity. We see ourselves as parts of something bigger than ourselves. And that understanding comes by the gradual practice of yoga. So the heart of yoga is meant to take us to the level of samadhi, to the level of spiritual absorption, where one perceives and relishes the deepest inner reality. Now, what is this inner reality? I'll talk about it. The yoga texts offer us a three-level model of the self. This three-level model of the self is that the body, mind, and consciousness, or we could call it soul. Mm -hmm. And this, to, we can understand it by comparing it to the hardware, the software, and the user in a computer system. So in any computer system, uh, if we consider what is visible to us is the hardware. The software is equally important, but it's not visible. And beyond that is the user. It's, if a computer is controlling uh, remotely, then we may not even see the user, we may only see the hardware functioning. So, so we have a physical, mental, and spiritual side. Now to understand this, let's do a simple thought experiment. So wherever you are seated, you can sit comfortably and you can close your eyes. And you can take three deep breaths. One. As you breathe in, feel the freshness from outside coming in. As you breathe out, feel all your tiredness going out. Breathe once again. Once more. Now, look at what you see in front of you with your eyes closed. You close your eyes and try to see what you see in front of you. Because your eyes are closed, you cannot see anything what is physically in front of you. But still, there is something like a screen inside you. And on that screen, you may see various images. You may see a friend. You may see a book. You may see your phone. You may see your home. You may see various images coming and going. Or you may see just a hazy array of colors over there. Whatever it is that you see, you see on a screen. Now while you are observing that screen, try to take a step back and catch sight of who is observing that screen. I repeat, you are looking at the screen, but look at who is looking at the screen. Try to catch sight of the inner seer of that screen. No matter how much you try to step back, the inner seer steps back with you. What you are looking for is what you are looking with. You are that inner seer. You are the consciousness. And that inner screen is your mind. You can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes. Thank you. Go ahead. So, this is a way to go ahead with this experiment. So, with this visualization, what we can understand is that what we are looking at outside, so you are looking at me, I am looking at you. This is the outer scene. And there is the inner screen on which 
whatever we are seeing externally appears. And it is only when something appears on the inner screen that we perceive it. So if at this moment, while you are sitting here, you suddenly remember, uh, say, how oh, did I lock my room when I came out? Oh, immediately thoughts start, I did this, I did this. Did I lock it? I didn't lock it. So as this inner screen starts displaying something else, you may not even hear what is going on over here. So for normal perception to happen, the inner seer, the inner screen and the outer scene have to be in one line. So normally when we talk, we are talking about the heart of yoga right now. So when we talk about yoga, normally the postures, the asanas, they focus primarily on improving the hardware. We try to change our body to make it fitter, to make it more flexible, to make it more uh, attractive. However, our own reality, our own self has multiple levels to it. So if we go further, yoga refers to, yoga essentially means connection. So what is it? The word yoga is in etymology, in word roots it related with the word yoke. And yoke means connect. So what is yoga going to do, meant to do ultimately? It is meant to connect us with our core self. So normally we are caught in externals, looking at the scene, oh this person is like this, this person is doing like this, I would like to buy this, I would like to see this. So we are trying to, we are caught in the outer scene and we are trying to experience better and better things at the physical level of reality. But yoga is meant to take us from the physical to the mental, ultimately to the spiritual. And thus yoga is meant to connect us with who we essentially are, to help us become aware of that. Can you go ahead? Now we talk about yoga of the heart. Now what do we mean by the heart over here? I talk about the heart of yoga is to go inwards. What is yoga of the heart? When we talk about the heart, it can refer to a biological or organ, but in most conversations, which are not in a medical context, that's not what we refer to. When we say, he broke my heart, she broke my heart, that doesn't mean the biological heart and organ heart has been broken into pieces. We refer there to the heart as the seat of emotions. And emotions are not present in the biological heart. They are not present in the biological brain also. The brain is essentially made of the same chemicals as the hand is made. It is ultimately made of atoms, molecules. It just has electrochemical signals going through them. So this, the heart refers essentially to the consciousness, the soul from which the consciousness comes out. And just as our heart, when it is broken, we, our emotions, which promises a lot of happiness, they end up giving us tribulation. So yoga is meant to take our emotions, yoga of the heart is meant to take our emotions to a place of safety, to a place of supreme satisfaction. Go ahead. Now with respect to emotions, it's like if we have physical pain, we can deal with it in two ways. We might just take a painkiller and cover the pain. Or we might take a curative medicine and we may try to cure the pain. The same we may try to do with emotions also. With, when, with our emotions, we may try to simply uh, just stultify ourselves. Just calm down. So for example, we might go outwards to just watch entertainment. Now many people speak not because they have something worthwhile to speak, but because they cannot tolerate silence. Inside so much turbulence is going on, hey this is wrong, that is wrong, this terrible thing happened over here, that terrible thing happened over there. The mind is so turbulent that we try to silence the mind's turbulence by trying to create some sound outside here. So either we speak or we turn on some device which speaks and we forget it. But that doesn't actually calm the 
agitated mind. Mental health problems are a huge source of distress in today's world. And all mental health problems, although they may have specific forms and specific causes, they are essentially a misdirection of our emotions. And misdirection of our emotions means our emotions are getting caught in something which is unhealthy, which is unwanted and which is having distressing consequences for us. So we may try to just calm our emotions down. So for example, yoga, when we go to the asanas are meant to make us physical reality fitter. The pranayam, the breathing is meant to calm our emotions down. As you slow down our breath, our emotions calm down. But there is more. There is pacification of emotions and there is purification of emotions. Pacification means that which is agitated, it just becomes peaceful. But till the emotions are purified, a person cannot actually find happiness in a lasting way. Why is that? Suppose somebody is an alcoholic and they temporarily go away from any situation that reminds them of alcohol. If they pass by a bar, immediately they get agitated. I want to drink. I want to drink. And one, two, three, four, they may have excessive drinks. But if they go away from a bar, they may not feel that craving for some time. What has happened? The emotions, the desires, the mind has become pacified. But the desires are still there and sooner or later they'll get activated. So we need to go beyond pacification to purification. Purification refers to something higher, something much more than just the silencing of the emotions. Go ahead. So when we talk about purification, essentially it means that yoga of the heart talks about a connection through devotion. I talk about yoga means connection and connection with ourselves. So there is a connection which can be made in various ways. Just like right now, if I want to charge my laptop, I make a connection. There is an electrical connection. Hmm. Uh, suppose we want to get some job done and we, we make a connection with the person who can do that job. Say if you want our, a house to be built, then we may connect with the person who is specialist in that. So there are different kinds of connections which can help us to do different things. So the devotion connection is what is called as bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is the yoga of the heart, where the heart's emotions are used to establish a deeper connection, a connection with our innermost core. So the Bhakti Yoga tradition explains that there is beyond, that, that there is the soul or the consciousness, there is finite consciousness. And beyond finite consciousness is infinite consciousness. And the finite consciousness and infinite consciousness are meant to be bonded in a connection of love. All of us long to love and be loved. So, before I move to this point of yoga of the heart, are there any comments or questions which any of you has till now? Is anything not clear? If anything struck you, any reflection that you would like to make till this point? Yes, please. Just a quick comment on the yeah. analogy you made earlier about a person who's an alcoholic. Hmm. Okay, so the challenge with that is, yes, if, if, if is the pacification same as cure, there are two things in this. One is, so there's a saying, out of the sight is out of mind. 
say something is not available, say if we have prohibition where alcohol is not available, then uh, people will not be able to drink it. But the problem is if the desire is there, then people will find some, some or the other way to do it. So I was in the Middle East just a few months ago. So Saudi Arabia has, Saudi Arabia is currently in the news for the wrong reasons, but Saudi Arabia has strict rules against alcohol consumption and other kinds of uh, activities that are considered immoral. But then just next to Saudi Arabia is Bahrain. And all the people who want to do something like this, every weekend, the traffic from Saudi Arabia to Bahrain is enormous. And people just go for the weekend over there, do all the things that they want to do, and they come back again. So external restriction, it can't help in a sustainable way unless there is an inner transformation. If somebody is an alcohol, and they may go to an alcohol de-addiction center. And there, one of the features is that there's no alcohol available over there. And that helps. But unless they create a better life for themselves, that means they find something more meaningful to do. Unless they have constructive activities in their life and especially some activity that fulfills the need which alcohol is fulfilling. People take alcohol either because they just want to escape from life. Life is so frustrating, I just want a break. So unless they find a healthier way to get that break, they'll not be able to get away from their alcohol. So pacification means Temporarily, the desire goes away. But actually, when we say the desire goes away, the desire is not just being triggered. But once the trigger comes, the desire will resurface. So external regulation helps if there is also help for inner transformation. But if there is no focus on inner transformation, then regulation does not help much. So regulation, people will find a way to bypass that regulation and continue to do what they want to do. So pacification is required, no doubt. But pacific in, in mathematics, sometimes there's necessary but not sufficient condition. So pacification is like that. We do need peaceful minds. But we, just, but we can't just get peaceful minds by going only to a peaceful setting. We might go to a peaceful setting, but can we always live in a peaceful setting? No. We live in a world where there is so much source of agitation. So we need to go inwards and find peace at our core. That's why pacification is helpful for purification. But if pacification alone is done, then that's not enough. It's like if a patient is a sick and is in pain, then the doctor may give pain medication, and it's required. But if pain medication is all that the patient takes, then that's not enough. The pain medication helps the patient to manage the pain so that they can take the curative medicine, maybe do some exercises, whatever is required. Otherwise, the pain will make life unbearable. So pacification and purification both are required. Just as pain medication and curative medication both are required. Okay? Thank you. Yeah? Yeah, just a quick comment about yeah. what you said, like our mind is like out of thing. Right. And I also agree with him, like if something is not available, like someone won't like reach it in the first place and then it's just like wrong, he won't have to just the desire to go back to it again. Though yeah, I'm half Saudi and I like live whole my life in Saudi Arabia. Okay. So I just want to like clarify like I don't know no one who went to like Bahrain because it's like on the east like on the west on the other side of the country and kind maybe of it's like not exactly Saudi, maybe that's some part of Saudi. Yeah, it's like an, our neighbor uh, country. And yeah. um, like as an adult, uh, I haven't been drinking or I don't know anyone in my surrounding who, like, who did drink. It's again a slaw. Someone can go to prison if like in Saudi I know. country or I know. Uh, participate in this kind of activity. So I think that the, bas the basic thing is like if someone did not try something in the first place, hmm. you don't like have to, to have that is true. inner fight to you know, crave to back to it again. That's true. So, um, like, I, and I don't know anyone of my around my circle who went to Bahrain for this kind of activity. That's we interesting. All, have, all our neighbors do have legal like alcohol and other kind of activities, but I think it's something that it as a children it's like something in, like how to say it, implanted in us 
that strong film just won't do it. That's true. But of course, there's some minority who will go because always there's like the dark side of our human being that we want to try something wrong. But then again, I think that because of like our community, this is illegal. So by time, they just it's not in our their reach, so they don't go for it. I think so. That's true, definitely. As you said that, where is where something is not reachable, and something is not been experienced, then it's just not in people's thoughts also. Exactly. So as far as I know, I was in Bahrain. I had to go from one place to another place for a program. And it was a, like a three mile drive. And it took us two and a half hours, because the traffic was so much. And that's what the locals over there told me. So maybe it's in a, Saudi Arabia is also a big country. Yeah. So it could be in another part of Saudi Arabia from which they're coming to Bahrain. But okay, it's a valid point. There are three, our desires can be of broadly three kinds. There can be a circumstantial desire, there can be a compulsive desire, and there can be a desire in between the two. Circumstantial desire means, okay, I see somebody drinking and I get the desire to drink. If I can get, I get it. If I don't get it, it doesn't matter. So if you're passing by a, a a place where coffee is available. Maybe I can want to drink some coffee. It's not that we are really thirsty or craving for coffee. But you see the circumstance, we get the desire. That's circumstantial desire. So if the circumstance is removed, then that circumstantial desire will not come at all. But there are some desires which are compulsive. Compulsive means that even if the circumstance is not there. One of my friends, his brother was an alcoholic. And they kept him strictly monitored. So they would keep, even they had told the local bars over there, you know, he's alcoholic, don't, don't give him any alcohol. So he went to some place, and he, he, was, he was quite well to do. He got a car. And in the car, uh, he, on the half, somewhere along the way, he told that my car is broken down. It's not working. And then he got a tow, and he had the car towed back. And then eventually they found that the car gas tank he had filled with alcohol. <laughs> and then he had got a straw to drink from there. He was opening the gas tank. So it's horrible. So if somebody is compulsive, no matter how much restriction you may put on that person, they'll find a way to do it. So if, if some, the desire is in between somewhere, it's neither, it's neither circumstantial nor compulsive. It's somewhere in between. Then, if the circumstance is removed, that if the desire is more on the circumstantial side, it will go away gradually. The desire is more on the compulsive side, then the person will change the circumstance to try to get that desire. So what we are talking here about is the situation where we all want peace. Now, we circumstantially cannot create a situation where there will be no trouble for ourselves no source of agitation for our minds. Because the world is such that there's so much change. And every change causes anxiety. Every change causes uncertainty. Of course, some change is positive, and that may bring some pleasure also. But change can cause anxiety and uncertainty. And just as we can't, the only thing constant in life is change. So the only unchanging reality is that reality is changing. So because of that, if we base our peace on something external, that peace will not last for long. We need to base our peace on something internal. So pacification means that we try to base our peace on the level of the inner screen, the mind. Make sure that nothing negative appears in the mind. But we can't always control that. From our past memory, something negative might come up. From the external situation, something negative might come up. So we can't avoid that. Okay. So let's move on now. Thank you. So beyond the, the, the devotion connection, the Bhakti Yoga tradition explains that there is infinite consciousness. And we are finite consciousness. And there is an eternal bond of love between the finite consciousness and the infinite consciousness. 
The infinite consciousness is not just a vague amorphous conception. It is described to be a, a loving and lovable person. All of us have a longing to live forever and to love forever. We consider most of the movies, most of the novels are about romance. Romance and most romance it ends in happily ever after. The idea that we should live happily with our beloved. And in real life if we see neither we live ever after nor our beloved loves ever after. So nothing in the world around us lasts forever. Then why do we have this desire to live forever and to love forever? If a child living in a remote African tribe uh, where there is no con internet, there is no connection, with the, no TV, no connection with the rest of the world, suddenly that child says, Mom, I want a pizza. The mother will ask, what do you think the mother will ask? What's a pizza? Or if she knows what's a pizza, she'll ask, how do you know what is a pizza? Isn't it? So if something has no stimulus in the external, then the question comes up, where does this come from? Where does the desire come from? Similarly, in the world around us, there is nothing that lasts forever. And yet all of us have a desire to live forever and a desire to love forever. So where does this desire come from? So the, the yoga tradition explains that the desire to live forever comes because we at our core are spiritual and eternal. And the desire to love forever comes because there is an eternal object of love. There is the infinite consciousness. There is the absolute truth. We can know him by different names in different traditions. We are doing the Kirtan a few minutes ago, that is, that involves the name Krishna, which I mean the names of Krishna. So Krishna is one name of the Absolute. The word Krishna literally means all attractive. So the yoga of the heart centers on using the emotion of devotion to establish a connection with the eternal reality, the supreme eternal reality. So now, just uh, we, we all, it's extremely cold, so our body needs a shelter, otherwise we'll die out of the cold. So just as our body needs a home, similarly our heart needs a home. One of the greatest needs in today's world is that people don't have a satisfying object of thought. They don't have anything to fix their mind on. Whatever they think of, agitates them. And entertainment is something which people seek because they hope to find something satisfying to fix their mind on. But entertainment entertains for some time and then it agitates. Because whatever we watch, it increases the cravings within us, it increases, we watch violence, it increases the violent action movies, increases the desire for anger within us. We look at beautiful people but living in wealth and that increases the desires within us. So, it promises a home, but it leaves us homeless. Entertainment, it is like a painkiller that actually makes the pain worse. So that inner shelter that we can experience through Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga centers on uh, connecting with the divine through our emotions. So for example, the musical meditation that we did, we do mantra meditation, we chant mantras. Through this, we raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. So from the outer seed through the inner screen to the inner seer. And as we do this progressively, we start experiencing three effects. Peace, purity and pleasure. We will we'll find that our thoughts will calm down. Not only will calm down, the unwanted, unhealthy thoughts will start going away. Purity. And ultimately, pleasure. We start experiencing a sublime joy that does not depend on anything external. And one experience of one way to understand this is that suppose there's a small baby 
who is sleeping on a cold evening like this and suddenly the temperature increases and the baby starts trembling. At that time the mother sees the baby and the mother puts a comforter on the child. Now the baby's eyes are closed and she has not seen the mother. But the baby is one moment was feeling cold, next moment suddenly starts, suddenly starts feeling soothing, comfort. So this indicates the baby understands this must be my mother. So she has not seen, but she understands through the experience. This must be my mother who has put that cloth on me. So similarly for us, when we practice bhakti yoga, when we direct our consciousness towards the divine through the practice of bhakti, then we start experiencing peace, purity and pleasure. And this is like a comforter put on our consciousness that indicates that there is a higher reality, there is a higher presence. And that higher presence is giving us an experience of transcendence, of a higher reality. And thus, by such experience, we move towards the heart of yoga. We move towards realizing who we are and whose we are. We as finite consciousness connect with the infinite consciousness. And therein is the supreme enrichment of life. So, we can live our life in two ways. We can be apart or we can be apart. Be apart means that we think of ourselves as independent beings who are just our material bodies, who have temporarily come alive and we live in a hostile, uncaring universe where we just flap around living for some time and we die. Or we understand that we are a part of something far bigger than ourselves. And our life is meant to connect with the whole. And yoga is meant to help the part to integrate with the whole. So bhakti yoga uses that which is probably our greatest power, the power of our emotions to connect the part with the whole. And when this connection is established, then in that connection comes stability, comes purity, comes serenity and ultimately comes ecstasy. So I'll summarize what I spoke today and then we can have some questions. I spoke today on the topic of the yoga of the heart. As the heart of yoga is the yoga of the heart. Started by yoga's enormous popularity in today's world. And along with that there is yoga which can offer us much more. Yoga is a multi-level concept. So to understand the multiple levels of yoga I talked about the eight stages where the initial stages focus on physical then they move towards the mental and then they move towards the spiritual. They progressively go inwards. To understand these three physical, mental, spiritual levels of reality, I talked about the, the metaphor of a computer. Body, mind and soul is like the soft hardware, software and user. And we did the thought experiment to understand how there is a outer screen, the outer scene, there is an inner screen and there is the inner seer. And, the, you know, and then we talked about how we can, yoga as it is practiced at the physical level through asanas, it can, it is like trying to make the physical reality better. But beyond that we can try to mental reality better by pacification. That is also good, but we need to go beyond pacification to purification. Not just curb the agitating desire, agitating thoughts, desires, emotions, but to cure them. And for that we talked about the spiritual dimension of life that we are finite consciousness and there is an infinite consciousness. The, our longing to live forever and to love forever is as out of place as is the longing of a, a tribal child for some unheard of food like pizza. So that our longing for eternal life, to, to live forever points to the core of ourselves which lives forever and our longing to love forever points to eternal object of love. So. The yoga, con yoga, which essentially means connection. So yoga connects us with ourselves. It takes us from the physical to the mental to the spiritual. And at the spiritual level, it connects us with our core, with the whole whose parts we are. And bhakti yoga is the process by which we channel our emotions, <coughs> the emotion of love, we channel it towards the divine. 
And by that channeling of emotion towards the divine, we experience life's <coughs> supreme perfection. So just as a baby experiences comfort, although the baby is not seeing the mother and infers that the mother is present, similarly, through bhakti yoga practice, we can experience peace, purity, and pleasure. And that points to our coming in the presence of a higher reality. So bhakti yoga invites us to stop living apart and to start living as a part of the whole. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. I have a couple. Yeah, please. Yeah. So you're saying that everything around us is, or do you think that everything around us is reality or perception? Good question. Is everything around us reality or perception? What we experience is perception of reality. We can't experience reality directly. We can always perceive things. Now, where is the perception coming from? That is the question. So. If there were no reality at all, there would be no perception also. Just like if somebody sees a mirage in a forest, in a desert, then what they are seeing is wrong. There's no water over there. But there, there are three things over there which are real. First is, there is something out there. There might be a sand which is reflected on, which sun rays are reflecting from and creating the perception of water. But there is sand over there. There is something which is perceived wrongly though, but it is perceived. Second is, there is water somewhere as a reality. Otherwise, why would somebody mistake that to be water? And there has to be an observer. The observer has to be real. So that means that there is something, there is the observed object, there is the observing person, observing subject, and there is the observation. Now, what is an illusion? What is unreal is that our observation may go wrong. But the observed, there is some observed object, we may observe it wrong. So, basically, the world around us is real in the sense that something physical, the physical reality is also a level of reality. But the illusion is that we think the physical to be the source of pleasure. We think the physical to be the source of lasting life. So the physical level of reality is temporary, but we mistake it to be eternal. We, we pin our hopes on getting lasting pleasure at the physical level of reality. So our perceptions can be wrong, but who is perceiving is real. What is perceived, the thing that is being perceived, there is also a reality to that. But it is our perception that goes wrong. Does that answer your question? You have something else in your mind? Um, Put the charger. I agree with, 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 the, with the point of um, reality is real and perception is, uh, I would say, subjective. Hmm. Good question. So, how is if you're changing our perception, how is that different from alcohol? Why do people drink if they don't want to accept their reality. Okay, agreed. If they want something in their body to distort reality. It's true. See, there is. Uh, it's a very thoughtful question. Thank you. But there's physical reality. There's mental reality. There's spiritual reality. Hmm? Now, the nature of physical reality is that. It is not very satisfying. In fact, there was a survey done in the Western world, America and Europe, of people who are, who are reasonably healthy, reasonably wealthy. What were their emotional states? And they found about 5% of the time of their lives they were happy, 5% of the time they were unhappy, and 90% of the time they were bored. 
90% bore. In fact, the whole entertainment industry is often called as a boredom industry. It's trying to cure people of their boredom. So the physical reality is not very satisfying. So now we want to experience something else. So what do we do? How do we experience it? At the level of the mind, either we can imagine ourselves or we can expose ourselves to someone else's imagination, which is what entertainment does. Or we can just take in some substances inside us which, which fire our imagination in delusional ways. So now, by this, what is happening? If you remember the earlier metaphor, there is the physical, there is the outer scene, the inner screen, and the inner seer. So whether it is through entertainment or whether it is through psychedelic drugs or whether it is to alcohol. We are trying to disconnect the mental reality from the physical reality. And we are trying to create something else in the physical mental reality which will, we hope will be more pleasurable, which will make us feel good. But when we are talking about spiritual growth, when we are talking about yoga practice, then we are actually going deeper. We're not talking about the inner screen. We're talking about going beyond the inner screen to the inner seer and perceiving reality at the spiritual level. So it's a completely different level of reality. And we may say, how do you know there is such a le level of reality also? That's a different issue which we can discuss. If there were not, no conscious observer, if there were no consciousness, we would not even be discussing whether there's reality or not. Now this, uh, this table, ex this desk exists, but it doesn't ask the question whether it exists or doesn't exist. It just exists. So we wouldn't ask this question if there were no consciousness at all. So consciousness is non-physical. And the level of reality at which consciousness exists. There is consciousness and there is distorted perception. So we may pursue things in a way which is wrong, or we may pursue things in a way which is right. But the perceiver is beyond the right and wrong perceptions. So through entertainment, through psychedelic drugs, through alcohol, we are trying to change what we perceive. Mm. But through spirituality, we are trying to realize the perceiver itself. And that perceiver, when we go to the deepest level of our, our, our experience, there we understand that we as the inner seer are indestructible. We are pure, we are spiritual. And that's why spiritual, that's why I said, uh, the, whether it is entertainment or whether it is alcoholism or whatever it is, that's all like a painkiller. But each of them is a painkiller that has different kinds of effects. Entertainment may not have that much effect, harmful effects. Mm. Alcoholism may have far more harmful effects. Some psychedelic drugs may kill immediately by an overdose also. So we could say that there are different kinds of painkillers which, which kill the pain, but they have different degrees of harmful effects. But the cure means going beyond the level of the mind to the spiritual level and experiencing reality at the spiritual level. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for your, yeah. Okay. So, anyone has any other comments or questions? Yeah, please. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, thank you so much. I love thank you. Thank you. We have a few books here in case you would like to have a look. Thank you. I'll talk about it later. Yeah. Sure. Tell me.
it's just like when life just brings us like things that we're not expecting and then we're frustrated or angry and so my question is like on, in those moments when you needed the connection the most and then the, the hardest to, to just to just put in yourself in in that position of being open to the connection like how do you do that mm, good question so when we are facing uh, turbulence in our life and that's the time when we need the connection the most but it's very difficult to connect ourselves connection is an ongoing process yeah it's a practical and a vital question which all of us face so i'll say there are three different three distinct aspects to this one is that uh, we develop the connection as a habit in the normal situation in our life so to the extent we do something habitually it becomes ingrained within us mm. so at if something has not been done as a habit at all and then in the moment of distress we try to do it it will be very difficult to do it because our emotions will be going hey what yeah. what we have done habitually that's what we do consciously repeatedly that's what we will do instinctively later so first is that when things are reasonably in our control that is the time we try to be spiritually conscious as much as possible we try to establish that connection make it a habit of establishing that connection the second is that when that kind of situation comes in our life it's very difficult to be spiritually conscious but we don't have to see being connected or being disconnected as a digital logic phenomena zero or one so it is that okay we became disconnected okay as soon as i realize i'm disconnected then i try to reconnect myself um i just came a few hours ago from dc so i came by plane now when a plane is flying pilots tell us that 90% of the time the plane is off course what gets the plane to the destination is that the that the pilot keeps reorienting the plane so just the momentum of the plane the atmospheric conditions all that will cause the plane to go off course but it get it back on course so similarly for us the the force of our situations may sometimes make us disconnected but as soon as we realize a disconnection that i am disconnected we try to reconnect ourselves so it doesn't have to be that because i am disconnected let me stay disconnected it is a it is a process which can be we can we can do course correction as and when we realize it and the last point is that if we can have some external aids for establishing that connection that means if we have some friends also who are spiritually minded if you are part of some social group where where people are spiritually minded if we have an environment if we have a spiritual center where we can do meditation where we can contemplate on spiritual layer. we go there so we uh, that we if there's a, if there's some external support an external aid then that helps us because although we want to go inwards what happens inwards is sometimes quite turbulent the, the consciousness the soul is there but the mind is also there and the mind is agitated so sometimes to go inwards if we can go outwards to a place that prompts us to go inwards that helps that's why having external supports is very important the external supports are not a replacement to the inner spiritualization but they are a vital aid to that spiritualization okay thank you so what time do we need to go for the next program we will be here in like 2 minutes no but but the next program yeah. what time sorry okay so any other comments or questions so yeah so it's cure that we should offer it's um, it's an action it's not something that's concrete it's something that's ongoing it's something that's created by habit it's something that we consciously choose from moment to moment yeah exactly thank you so thank you very much thank you thank you Krishna